said, I just wanted to thank uh, all of you for attending. I wanted to acknowledge and thank uh, our team members, uh, Esther Her, our project manager, Callie Morgan, our intern for publicizing the event, along with Jillian Dudziak, our ACE web guru, Scott Lewis, our creative director, uh, is here, and Serena Stellatano, <clears throat> our metaverse designer, is, is also uh, here as well. And of course, our main presenter, uh, Sotira Sedaris. So we're very grateful to the core team for being here, all of you, and of course, our friends and colleagues from Reporters United and Investigate Europe. So I just wanted to talk for a minute uh, about CCIJ. Um, as I said, we're the Center for Collaborative Investigative Journalism. <clears throat> At CCIJ, we bring together visual, data, and investigative journalists as equal partners to carry out ongoing investigations into key global issues. Um, we have a strong commitment to working with and learning from journalists who might not have the chance to participate in global projects, <clears throat> excuse me, and we also have a strong commitment to and practice of different types of training, uh, professional development experiences, fellowships, and so on. And so that's where this professional learning calendar that Esther has worked so hard on and put together, and now Sotiris will uh, present for us in just a minute, um, fits in. And so this is really an historic event for us. This is our first two-part training. Uh, previously, we're very proud of the work we've done, but they've been self-contained single sessions. So this is the first in a two-part event. It is also the largest sign-up for an event we've had uh, for a project and a, a session led by a core team member. And also uh, Serena Stellatano, our metaverse designer, is broadcasting this event live in our spatial space uh, in the metaverse featuring uh, this project. So Serena, if you want to uh, share that link to whatever your degree, you're comfortable doing that, please feel free to do that. We're not yet totally launching it, but we are open to sharing it. So here is the plan for today. Um, I will just give a brief overview of the session, which is really about uh, building data sets to tell powerful stories, <clears throat> monitoring fossil fuel shipments from Russia since 2022 as a case study. Um, so Tiris will take us through uh, for about 35 minutes. Uh, from there, uh, so Tiris will turn over to a couple of colleagues for about five minutes to just share about their work on the project. We'll have about a little over 10 minutes of Q&A, and then I will close out the session. We'll have a brief survey. Uh, we'll find out about the next session, which is on Thursday, April 13th, and just share information about the recording. So that is our plan uh, for the session. So just before I turn over to Sotiris, I just wanna say how thrilled I am that all of you are here but also that Sotiris is a member of our team. He's done fantastic work since joining CCIJ's core team uh, last year. And this project that he's working on is one of two, as Sotiris is literally one of the only data journalists in the world who was on two projects that were recently named finalists in the Sigma Award for Data Journalism. So that's just one of many, or two really, of many commendations that he's earned. So. Uh, please join me in welcoming Sotiris Sedaris. Thank you so much, Sotiris. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Thanks, everybody, for joining our session. I will start uh, sharing my screen now. Um, okay, here we go. So I guess that you can now see my screen. Uh, as... Jeff said, I'm Sotiris, I'm a core member of the CCIJ, I'm the data editor, and today we will be talking about fueling war, how European ships keep process economy afloat as a case study of building your own uh, data sets um, to tell these kind of powerful international stories. Uh, the agenda for today's session is, uh, will be, will follow a short introduction to the investigation, the role of the data, the tools we used, and some basic instructions step, step step by step on how you can build your own data sets. 
Um, I'll try to be, as you know, uh, I'll try to explain everything in detail. Um, to be fair, again, I think that in order to start building your own data sets, of course, you need to know how to sort or to filter some columns and rows um, in Excel or, you know, uh, Google spreadsheets. But to be fair, here, I think that we are going to need some more advanced uh, coding and data driven uh, methodologies. Uh, bear with me because I'll try to make it again as short and sweet as possible. And I just want to let you know that in case you are interested in this specific story and how you can expand it to cover your own territories or in any other kind of stories that you know that there is data or there is no data and you want to tell these stories based on uh, this kind of information, please do reach out to me or to CCIJ and let's just talk about, you know, how we can do this together, how we can be of any help in your data-driven stories. Uh, thankfully, Jeff really talked about um, the Center for Collaborative Investigative Journalism. So I will skip this slide and I'll uh, proceed straight to the investigation, the fueling war investigation, uh, which again is a data project to monitor how European shipping firms continue to transport fossil fuels from Russia despite the ongoing war in Ukraine. Um, we have found that several European vessels have exported more than half uh, of all fossil fuel shipments from Russia since the start of the war. There are many explanations for that. Uh, the main reason um, would be, and I can talk only about Greece here, is that Greek ship owners really own 30% uh, of the global fleet of oil tankers. They are huge. Even if Greece is a tiny country, the shipping industry of Greece is the biggest, the, yeah, it's the biggest in the world. So we had a natural, you know, interest in, in that kind of investigation. I will talk about the data in more detail. And I just want to mention that um, Reporters United, the outlet, the investigative network that started this um, investigation, really, really uh, investigates um, fossil fuels and the shipping industry of Greece in a very, very unique way. And I can talk more about that uh, very soon. Uh, so again, the, the story started, was initiated from Reporters United in Greece as a data monitoring mechanism into how Greek shipping dominates seaborne transports from Russia. After a while, we collaborated with our partners, strategic partners, Investigate Europe, which is um, a European network of investigative reporters in order to involve this um, local uh, focused investigation into an international uh, ongoing long-term project uh, that really monitors and tries to um, keep people and companies accountable on this kind of under the table, maybe funding uh, of the war in Ukraine. How we did it and what we have done until now. To tell the story, to tell this kind of very challenging and demanding story, we combined in-depth data analysis and data gathering, investigative reporting on the ground, investigative reporting and online investigative reporting, visualizations, different multimedia elements, and of course, traditional storytelling. Um, the investigation is still ongoing uh, in Greece. We started it in March uh, 2022, a couple of uh, weeks after uh, the start of the war at the end of February. Um, and it is the, the stories being presented in a diverse and creative way across several platforms, meaning that we have already published stories on our websites. Uh, our stories have been featured um, in newspapers, in TV programs. Um, the New York Times have um, featured our reporting on their in their own reporting and the list goes on. So up until now, 11 publishing organizations have 
uh, taking part in these collaborative cross-border investigations. The results and all the stories that we have published uh, can be read in nine different languages, uh, including, of course, Greek and English. Um, we are, up until now, a team of 20, I would say we are more. Um, we are a diverse team of investigative reporters, data journalists, um, visual storytellers um, who work collectively and collaboratively on this project. Up until now, eight in-depth international stories have been published on Investigate Europe and 25 local stories have been published in media of our partners, of Investigate Europe's partners. These three are the very first three Greek stories that initiated everything. Um, the first story was published in May 17, 2022. Uh, even if we started monitoring this kind of trade uh, very early in uh, the beginning of the war, we needed some time and we needed some time in order to first get the data in the way that I'll show you right after, clean the data, analyze the data, do multiple rounds of fact checking because you cannot really only rely on data and I'll tell you why very soon. Um, the, the biggest and the strongest and the most powerful tool in this report, in this kind of reporting, I think is common sense and, you know, being really curious to look into the data and look into, uh, all, you know, these company registries and the people behind the companies. That's why we always publish, uh, the methodology behind our investigations. We want to be as transparent as possible. We want other people to make use of our data and of our methodology and apply these kind of resources into their own reporting. Um, and then, of course, the, the uh, follow-up story in July 2022. 20, and that's when we started getting together with Investigate Europe in order to make this project international because of course it's not only about Greece, it's really about Europe. And if you ask me, it's not only about Europe, it's a global issue as you know, the recent developments on the ground uh, have been uh, dictating. So on the right part of my screen, of your screens, you can see all the 25 uh, local stories that have been published so far. Um, these stories focus on multiple levels. They focus on, you know, sanctions, they focus on embargoes, they focus on the owners, and they focus on the real, you know, positions and roots of these oil tankers. Uh, beyond Greece, our findings were also published in Belgium, Germany, Italy, Norway, Poland, Portugal, Spain, and Russia, as we said before, in 10 languages. And here, uh, you can see the four of the eight uh, international stories on Investigate Europe. These are the eight, four, and four. Uh, again, these stories um, have multiple levels and layers. You can find overview stories of the whole, you know, situation uh, in the trading of fossil fuels from Russia, seaborne fossil fuels. You can find specific, you know, um, data is driven and focused stories um, as part of this kind of series. You can find um, stories on the nuclear exports together with the oil exports. You can find photo reportages and you can find more explainers. So what we try to do always with this kind of projects is that we are trying to create a whole network of people, organizations, um, locations, methodologies, techniques, and resources so that other people can really look into great depth in uh, these kind of stories and again try to collaborate in order to make more, to create more impact um, and more visibility for our stories. So, the interesting part, the role of the data. This is just 20 lines out of the 7,000 unique 
uh, rows that we have identified 7,000 unique um, voyages, shipments of uh, Russian fossil fuels since the beginning of the war. And this, if I'm not mistaken, goes up until uh, January 2023. You can find this um, data set online or it is um, stored on Google Drive and there is a link. I'm sure there is a link by right by now in the chat, but you can also go to Investigate Europe's website, read the story, all the story, the whole story up until the end, and then you can click uh, to the, uh, the the link to, to uh, the data set. So, um, I'm sure people that are involved in data journalism or people that are not involved can really uh, identify three different roles, three different functionalities of data. And um, I'm very proud because with this project, we have managed to combine all three different uh, angles and uh, functions of data. First and most important, if you ask me, is that data for this kind of reporting uh, played the role of the spine. The whole story was uh, evolved from uh, the data. So it is heavily based on data gathering and data analysis. And it's because these kind of stories haven't uh, done be ha haven't been realized before in that way. Uh, in a way that you know you really pay attention to the data and you really go after companies and people and try to confront them. And confronting uh, those people is a very, very, very important part of this project because data can always do the heavy lifting, but after that, you need real and brave journalists and reporters as journalists in this call today, and thanks to my colleagues at Reporters United and Investigate Europe and all the local partners that did this brave work of going after people and companies because it's not always the safest thing to do. Uh, so the, the, story, the focus of the stories was really shaped by the data we used and the structure again allowed us to combine on the ground reporting with data wrangling, visual storytelling, and tell this kind of very important story across uh, countries, platforms, and formats. The second use and the second um, uh, feature of our data is that it provided context. It provided very important context, both for the readers uh, and for us. Like before starting this project, I knew nothing about the shipping industry, I never, I didn't know that Greeks um, hold 30% of the global fleet. I didn't know anything about that. So this kind of data helped us contextualize uh, this trade and this, you know, very, very sometimes underreported part and uh, level of the ongoing war in Ukraine. So, of course, apart from uh, tracking and monitoring vessels through contextualizing the data, we were able to tell more stories. We were able to tell more stories about Europe's dependency on oil and nuclear energy from Russia, as well as the role of uh, the sanctions and the embargoes on Russia in order to stop or to really not stop um, their trading of fossil fuels to Europe. And then uh, the third uh, angle of the data is that we used it as a guide. The data really guided us to specific places and specific people. For example, in Italy, uh, we were able to locate uh, on time specific ports of arrival of oil tankers. And we were able that way to um, pinpoint these locations to our local reporter, Lorenzo and Maria in Italy. Uh, so Lorenzo went there. Lorenzo went to Sicily, to the port of Milazzo in order to shoot um, uh, the arrival of uh, an oil vessel. And through doing this, through being able to identify specific locations, we were also able to tell 
a new story, a separate story, which is really based on images, on photographs. On the right side of my screen, you can see two very interesting guys, uh, Mr. Marinakis and Mr. Alafuzos, one of the key players of many industries in Greece. These guys, apart from being ship owners, they own the biggest TV stations in Greece, as well as uh, the biggest, the two biggest uh, football teams in Greece. Um, and that's how we managed to reach them. We managed to reach them through the data. And of course, we have sent them questions. They haven't really replied. But what is very interesting about these people, and they are not the only uh, media owners in our data set, is that they would use their TV stations and their media in order to condemn publicly um, the attack, the invasion uh, to Ukraine. Uh, they have also um, organized football matches be, um, between uh, their um, teams and some international teams in order you know, to raise money or to raise awareness for the war in Ukraine, and at the same time, they are people, among others, that do this kind of uh, trades with um, Russia. Their vessels do carry Russian fossil fuels, while at the same time, their media outlets will condemn the attack in Ukraine. That's funny. So this kind of contextualization uh, was lighted, was highlighted, sorry, by the shared visual language of all publications. This shared visual uh, data visualizations allowed us to really translate and adapt all these different data viz into different publications, styles, and formats. And this very hard and important work was done by our colleagues at the Innovation Lab of Tagi Spiegel. Here you can find, you can see uh, some examples of the data visualizations. What they have created, what data, what, sorry, the Innovation Lab of uh, Tiger Spiegel has created is a back-end system where they will upload or all the data viz that they have created as part of the project and its local partner has access with uh, unique logins to that back-end system which means that each partner can just translate the title, the subtitle, and you know the legends, the names of the countries and the, name of the, the names of the companies here in their own languages and just you know, copy and paste and embed code to their websites and it's done. The data is, is done, which you can imagine how much time, energy, money and resources uh, has saved from us uh, because the data viz was almost ready. We created the data set at uh, Reporters United and Investigate Europe, and Tagge Spiegel got this data set and they visualized it for everybody, for all these uh, different local partners. And this is a fascinating back end system that is still ongoing and uh, it's being used. Uh, in many, many different uh, investigations. It, it really helped us save so much time and energy. So let's move on to the tools that we've used. Um, you can always turn your mics on and interrupt me if you have a question. Otherwise, I'm sure that Esther is really collecting all the uh, questions that you have and we can really have a Q&A by the end of this. Uh, short introduction. So these are just some of the tools that we have used. Of course, we started from Twitter, uh, from the Russian Tanker Tracker, automated account by Greenpeace UK. I'll show more screenshots very soon. And then we used Vicinitas.io to download the bot's tweets. Of course, the heavy lifting and the most important part of the data gathering and analysis was done in Python. Uh, we scraped marine traffic and equaces. I'll talk in more detail about these platforms very soon. Uh, we used uh, APIs and more specifically uh, CREAS um, API. It's the Center for Research on Energy and Clean Air. Amazing people and group of researchers. 
We use the online tool Open Refine for some extra cleaning and a grouping of our data. Of course, Google Sheets in order to store the data and share them with our editors and local reporters. And then we used um, JavaScript's D3 library in order to visualize the interactive, um, to, to produce the interactive data viz and Django REST API uh, for the backend I just talked about. There is a front end um, uh, level as well, but I know nothing about that, so I didn't include it. But if you have questions about the front end and the back end of the database system, please do send me a question and I will share it. I will forward it to Tiger Spiegel and we can talk about how they did it. So for Twitter tools, first one uh, is the... Uh, is the automated account, it is the Twitter bot that Greenpeace has uh, developed, and this is how everything started. This was the first source of information for us at Reporters United that initiated uh, the project. And it's a funny story because we never, you know, planned to, to do this kind of story. We were just one day at the office, the core team of Reporters United talking about and working different projects. And then some other journalists from Greece have written about the existence of this Twitter bot. And at that time, I was really into Twitter bots and how people can really download Twitter data without having any coding skills for uh, the university class I'm teaching. And Nicolas, our editor at Reporters United, it was like, guys, there is this, uh, there is this Twitter bot, and I was like, okay, bring it on. What's what's in there, um, and what's in there is very interesting. But before moving there, let me tell you about Vicinitas.io. is just an online tool that allows you to download the uh, the most recent three thousand two hundred tweets of any user of any user who has their profile uh, public not private uh, and it's really less than five clicks to downloading this data you just copy paste the twitter handle of the profile that you want to get the tweets and you just paste it here you press user tweets it loads and now you see <clears throat> sorry and now you can read this uh alarming text saying that the Twitter API will not be available soon, of course, because of Elon Musk trying to mess up with that. Um, but bear with us, because even if they block the API, we will still find ways to get this data. We will always do. Uh, and the good thing is that all these tools are free and people do really use them. So this is the nice and structure Twitter data that anybody can get from uh, Vicinitas. And there are multiple other tools out there that can help you do this kind of labor. Um, it's important to tell about the 3,200 most recent tweets because we were lucky and we identified this bot very early in its existence because that way we were able to download the tweets every day because as you can see now the twitter bot this is a very recent uh, i think um screenshot the twitter has published the bot has published more than 5000 tweets which means if you started today you would never be able to get the whole timeline of that twitter account so we were lucky we started early and then uh, we kept repeating this uh, process every day. Uh, imitation and repetition is always a very important part of my work as a data journalist, and I think most journalists, data journalists do that. They um, replicate their methodologies every day in different projects, because to be fair, in coding and in data journalism, and especially with Python, 80% uh, is Googling your question and 20% is your 
skills as a data journalist, and I would say 15% is that and 5% is memory. Memory of what you've done and where to really look into. And that's why structure is really, really important in how you are keeping your archive. So going back to Twitter data, you can see all the different columns um, that are available after downloading the, the Twitter um, data set. This is how you get it, guys, really. Um, you don't have to uh, clean on, or analyze or you know do something really advanced uh, in order to get Twitter's data. This is the first thing that you open as a file in your local system. You can find the Twitter ID, the tweet ID, the text, which is the most important part for us here because we did some text analysis in order to identify uh, the features of its vessel. Um, and I never said what this Twitter bot does. So what this Twitter bot does is that every time that a vessel, any vessel, any oil tanker, to be fair, and gas tanker, um, it leaves a Russian port, this tweet, this bot publishes a tweet with this information that the vessel named X just left that port named Z in Russia, um, full of fossil fuels with a destination, with an international destination. Let's don't talk about destinations now. So, and there is also what is really important is that this bot. Um, does this kind of labor by monitoring marine traffic. Marine traffic is this website, and I'll talk right after about that. They do track vessels by monitoring uh, marine traffic. And part of the Twitter text, of the tweet text, is the link of its vessel on marine traffic. And this is super helpful because it's about always what kind of input you provide to your code and what type of um, um, output you really um, want to get. So through text analysis, we were able to filter out, to extract all the links of all the vessels uh, that are involved in these exports and Looping through them in Python, we were able to visit the marine traffic page of its vessel. And that's super important because the marine traffic of its vessel, apart from some general characteristics of the vessel, uh, does list the IMO number of the vessel. The IMO number of a vessel is a unique identifier uh, that um, follows the vessel throughout its lifespan. A vessel can change name in a night. A vessel can be sold and bought several times throughout its lifespan. Um, but the IMO number will always be there and will always be the same. And that's the main thing that you are trying always to identify when you are building your own data sets, unique identifiers. And we were super lucky because um, Twitter was there. The link to marine traffic was extracted through text analysis. Then from text analysis, we moved to marine traffic. We extracted through scraping um, the IMO number of the vessel. And then we moved to the next platform called Equasis. Equasis is um, a shipping information management platform, and it's uh, the official platform that many countries and governments use throughout the world, which means that um, the information that you find there is legitimate. And this is what you can see when you enter Equasis. Uh, you have to create a profile there, which is for free. They just ask you a couple of questions and then your profile is ready. And what we did was that we used the IMO number that we got from marine traffic and we feed, we fed the IMO number in this search box here, of course, automatically. 
And when you do that, you go to uh, the information page of its vessel. This part here is the same in marine traffic and equasis. These information are available in both platforms. And you can see the IMO here, right? What is only available in equasis and not in marine traffic is this part at the bottom of this screenshot. And this part here is um, the management details of uh, its vessel, which means um, the registered owner of a vessel, the, um, the ship manager or, or commercial manager, and the ISM manager, which is the manager of uh, insurance. Uh, and that's how we manage to match um, vessels with companies. And after that, when you have all this information, what you do is that you manually go and match companies with the real owners. Well, how you do that? Either you look into the financial reports, the year, the, the annual reports of these companies, or you just search online who owns that company. And that's how you find who is really behind these kind of transactions. That's how I scraped Equasis. Uh, and this happened after um, Investigate Europe joined um, uh, the investigation because when Investigate Europe joined our investigation, we had to rethink and restructure our methodology in order to track more uh, vessels and in order to track more voyages. So I had to use three different machines to do that because again, you need a login, you need a password to access Equasis, which means that I can only have one window per machine. And of course, I was using a VPN to do that so that I make myself as um, incognito as possible. This thing really didn't work eventually because I think now Equasis has blocked um, the feeding of the um, uh, search box here. And I think it's because of us, and I hope it's because of us, because I was scraping Equasis like crazy for days and nights in order to make, the, make ends meet on the deadline. And this is the final, no, it's not still the final, it's the combination of Twitter, marine traffic and Equasis data all in one place based on the unique identifier. I will rush because I am very out of time, um, but I will. I want to briefly talk about CREA, the Center for Research on Energy and Clean Air and their data set, which is more complete than the data set that we have compiled because they track also um, coal uh, vessels, not only oil and gas as we did, but they also list transactions, transfers of coal. And this created multiple problems, but also this helped us find and locate more vessels and more um, companies behind them. And the, their data is for free. What we did was that our colleague, Konstantina Maltepioti from Reporters United, uh, reached out to them and they uh, she asked for the data and the guys just got back to us saying okay yeah sure here's the data here's the api endpoint let's have a call and they were super friendly and super available and we had you know regular calls every second friday or anything because many questions um were asked from both us the data people as well as the local reporters so in total, four different data sets, Twitter bot, marine traffic, Equasis, CREA, all of them combined into a master data set uh, based on the IMO number. This is it. And these are some um, screenshots of the code I used to scrape Equasis. Um, I just want to show you some code. I want to take the fear away from people that think data journalism is not possible and coding is not possible. Um, because even if it looks chaotic, it's really copy-pasting the same code in different boxes, believe me.
And I will stop here because we have talked about how you can build your own data sets in the past. And I'll make sure that this presentation will be available to you. And again, I want to make sure that everyone can reach out to me with more questions uh, after the session and before the second session. Thanks so much for uh, following. And um, if Jeff, if you agree, Jeff, uh, Nicholas and Chris can briefly talk about their work in the project. No, that, that's absolutely fine. Um, first of all, can we acknowledge Sotiris for this terrific, accessible, passionately delivered session? Thank you so much, Esther, for the materials in the chat, but very exciting work about taking something that really is one of the major stories happening in the entire world and using publicly available data, working with journalists across borders to deliver a very impactful, high quality and ongoing investigation. So I just want to acknowledge that. And I really appreciate, Sotiris, your efforts to make this as accessible as possible. And this is the first of a two-part session. So why don't we hear from Nicholas and Chris briefly. Nicholas and Chris, if you can combine, wrap up by, uh, the next seven minutes, then we can have a few minutes for questions and then close out and Esther will be uh, signing off. But thank you so much, Esther, for uh, guiding us and providing such helpful information. But please join me acknowledging Sotiris's exceptional work. Thanks. Maybe. Thank you, Jeff. Very Thanks nice. For, Very nice. for being here throughout the session. Uh, I just want to welcome uh, Nicolas Leodopoulos, uh, co-founder of Reporters United and our editor there, uh, Nicolas, please. The floor is yours. Yes, actually, maybe Chris wants to start, but I will also give the floor to Thodoris Kondroyanos, who is a, a very important member of our team because this has been a real a teamwork, uh, both at Reporters United and Investigate Europe. And uh, we have been doing this uh, together. Uh, from the Reporters United uh, side, it has been Sotiris as our data editor, Todoris Kondroyanos and Konstantina Maltepiotti, who is also here uh, in, uh, in the call. So uh, I would give the floor to, uh, to Todoris and also maybe Chris wants to have a few words. Uh, yeah, no, thanks, Nicholas. Um, hi, everyone. A real pleasure to, to be here. And Sotiris, again, a brilliant, brilliant uh, presentation there. I mean, just perhaps briefly, I mean, from our side at Investigate Europe, it was a real privilege to be involved in this with Reporters United. Um, they did a lot of great work on the data and, and building out these data sets and also the initial concept of the story. Um, from our side, it was, it was excellent because we were able to build on some of that work from a cross-border perspective. Um, and so really utilize our strengths as an organization and, and utilize the the expertise of our reporters in Spain and Italy uh, and Norway and Portugal to really, in a way, elevate the story beyond a national perspective and make a, a pan-European um, story from this. So identifying shipping companies and owners uh, and then using the knowledge of these reporters in these countries to, to find out more about some of these individuals and companies. Uh, and in doing so, it really helped us move the story into a, a different domain. Um, and so it was a real, real great uh, experience to be involved in. And, um, and the data was obviously central to, to the story and um, everything in a way came from, came from that. Um, so really it was a, it's been a great experience. And um, yeah, I think there's, you know, lots of great learnings that Satori shared there about the challenges and the opportunities with the data. Um, but also in the many other facets, be it the cross-border approach or the, the multimedia elements and the, the other storytelling techniques. So um, it really was a, a kind of a, a great example, I feel, of, of this cross-border reporting. Um, and yeah, so also happy to take any questions or have any conversations after the, after the presentation. Um, perhaps I'll uh, pass on to Todoris for a bit more of a, a perspective from, from Greece and, and uh, 
yeah, how it was was from from your side. Thanks, thanks, Chris. And I have to acknowledge that Chris did all the work with the data analysis and making the data available to all local reporters. We really based our analysis on Chris's work. Thodoris, please. Yes, hello from my side. I'm Thodoris Kondrogenos. I am a member of Reporters United. And I would like also to thank uh, Sotiris for, uh, for this presentation. It was so good that I don't have a lot to say. I would like only to, to stress three different things regarding this investigation. Uh, the first thing is, uh, as, as, uh, we, uh, as it was uh, said by, by Sotiris, this was an underreported um, uh, thing in Greece, how the Greek ship owners uh, transported uh, Russian fossil fuels uh, throughout uh, the last year or so after the, the Russian invasion to Ukraine. And as you, as you may know, um, the state of media in Greece is a little bit problematic because a lot of media belong to powerful um, uh, business people and also ship owners. So the sector where the Greek economy is very important is the only se sector, the ship owners that are really important on a global scale. So we wanted to report on that because no one did uh, in the country. For example, as here we have, for example, ship owners that control media, they raise money and they gather food in order to send it to Ukraine. They say that the Russian invasion is a bad thing. Of course, it's a bad thing. But uh, on the same time, what they do is they transport Russian fossil fuels. They make money out of that. They provide Moscow with uh, billions of euros. So we wanted to, to, you know, to expose this kind of, of hypocrisy throughout the Greek media, but also uh, the business sector um, and the Greek ship owners. Of course, this would be very. Um, this would not be very interesting for for a European or for a global um, audience if it was only for Greece. So uh, this is where the data and, of course, the cross-border uh, character uh, nature of this investigation come up. For example, uh, the collaboration with Investigate Europe and data helped a lot in order to tell this as a European and a global story, and not you know have a very specific and not so broad audience uh, in Greece. And I think this is also a matter of objectivity. For, uh, for example, with uh, thanks to, to data, uh, we had the opportunity to have all the Greek and European ship owners transporting Russian fossil fuels. And this gave, uh, provided the investigation with objectivity because otherwise it would be unfair you know, to pick one or two and then leave others uh, out of this. So this was, this helped us a lot in, um, in accountability and, of course, in objectivity in order to show uh, to our readers, to a European audience, that we want to name uh, all the names of, of, this, uh, of the ship owners. So that's from my side, of course, we're open for discussion and questions. Thank you very much again. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Chris and Todoris. And we're very grateful to you and your organizations for our collaboration and ongoing uh, connection. So we want to be respectful of time. We have about 10 minutes left. I have a couple announcements at the end. I know Sotiris just I put his email in the chat and also he wanted to share a little bit about how you can take some of this material and then prepare for the next session. I also wanted to acknowledge that our Africa editor Ajibola Amzad and members of our West Africa hub are here. But uh, why don't we turn it over a couple questions, either raise your hand Put in the chat, either Soteris or Chris or Nicolas or Constantina, whoever, whoever's the right person can respond or right people can respond. But let's, let's have a few minutes of questions. And again, remember that also there'll be uh, a, a little bit more interactive session the next time Soteris just really broke down how he did this very intricate with the colleagues, it's very intricate investigation in this session. And so it could have been a much longer presentation, but he covered a tremendous amount of ground. So. Questions, uh, comments, any any uh, thoughts from that folks would like to ask uh, in a few minutes before we start to wrap up? The floor is open. Yes, Axel. Yes, Axel. Please over to you. And Axel is. Uh, yeah. A, a, a journalist, I believe, from is it Finland, Axel? You're from Finland. Yes. Yes, yes I'm from. Welcome, Axel. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very good presentation. I like to ask: Do you know have 
do you have information in what shape these oil tankers are? Because our Coast Guard says that uh, Russia is buying up oil tankers now very much, and they are quite old. And, and thank you, thank you for that, Axel. And also, just so you see, Soteris uh, Liza, friend and colleague from the Solutions Journalism Network, is asking, can you talk a little bit about the impact? So, Axel, about the shape of the ships, and then Liza about the impact. So maybe if you can address both of those, please. Thank you so much. Thank you, Axel, and thank you, Liza. Thank you so much for this question. Um, I will ask. I will answer uh, through what equations and marine traffic lists as the current situation of the vessels and the vast majority of them are working properly according to them. But if uh, people from Reporters United on Investigate Europe want to um, give a more detailed answer to that and maybe what the role of a flag uh, on a vessel plays and if that's interesting for this kind of question, Guys, please feel free to jump in. Uh, I know that there have been many kind of reports saying that the shape of the fleet is not at the best one. And there have also been some stories about the so-called shadow fleet that is involved in this kind of uh, transactions. But Nicolas or Theodoris or Chris or Constantina, if you want to comment on that, please feel free. They might want well, to I, I can I, 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 I can say I can say a couple of things. I mean, there have been some coverage in the international press, but mostly in the shipping press, press about the so-called shadow fleet. What has happened is that because of the sanctions regime, um, um, I mean, to put it in another way, uh, the, the Europeans still control a major share because of the Greeks, they control a major share of uh, oil transport from Russia to the rest of the world, because the sanctions do not forbid that. The sanctions put pressure because of the price cap, because you cannot get more money than the price cap allows. At the same time, this is a lot of pressure, both on the Europeans, but also on Russia. So what Russia has been doing, they have, and also China, because China is, has become, due to a geopolitical shift, the biggest buyer of Russian oil. We have to understand that this has been oil that until the war in Ukraine was mostly going to Western markets, to Europe and the US. Because of the war and because of the sanctions, now you have new buyers. It is China and it is India also. So what is happening is that uh, Russia is building the so-called shadow fleet, buying huge numbers of tankers. Uh, those tankers are owned by very shady companies. We do not know the owners of the companies. Most of those tankers are not good tankers. They are old tankers. And this creates a huge uh, risk also for the environment because in the previous state of affairs, you would have a very much well-structured uh, condition where the tankers would be new, there would be good insurers, uh, there would be good monitoring, et cetera. But now because of the sanctions, there is this new market of tankers because the oil still has to flow. Somebody's selling and somebody's buying. And this again constitutes a real, constitutes a real environmental risk because of the two things, the old age of the tankers, uh, the bad state they are, some of them as uh, Sotiris implied, um, are, uh, let's say, under jurisdictions that are very dodgy. Um, and the third thing is that there is no monitoring or regulation of the situation. Well, th th thank you uh, very much, Nicolas. And um, so, Tiris, if you can you. speak to, uh, then th yeah, th yeah, thanks for the question. So, Tiris, if you can speak to the impact that Liza asked and then Antoine asked kind of a related question about uh, the Greek government in particular, is Greek shipping, uh, do Greek ship companies pay taxes on the shipments? He's heard that Greek uh, shipping is basically detaxed. So if you can speak to those two and then we will wrap up to be mindful of people's time. So, so Teres, if you can take those two questions as kind of as one. 
Yeah, I'll take the first question <laughs> and then someone from uh, Reporters United can take okay. the second one because okay. they know better than me. When it comes to impact, um, our reporting stands at the core of a big slab that one of the uh, two media owners that we talked about uh, has sued against um, another politician and that, you know, really goes into the government and saying, guys, like to the government, your friends, like the media owners and ship owners are the one who are really funding the war. And one of the media owners again should with a slap that uh, politician. And then our reporting, as I said before, has been featured in New York Times and Deutsche Welle as a on the ground reportage in Portugal. Um, the prime minister was confronted by the opposition with the findings of our investigation. Let me check again. Um, one very famous stand-up comedian is using our findings in his gigs. And I would say that one of the greatest impacts this project uh, has created is that more colleagues and more organizations really want to start tracking what is going on with these imports in their countries. And here I'd like to give a huge shout out to CCIJ and Adzibol Amzad of Africa Editor for taking over this project into the West Africa Hub, which is a very beautiful and great network of journalists um, hosted really by Adzibola and uh, the CCIJ. And this investigation is going to take place in Africa as well. People, journalists there will be looking into Africa and especially the Western part of Africa as a new hotspot of this kind of transfers. Um, uh, from my side, that's the greatest impact uh, our reporting has created. Uh, people from, again, Investigate Europe and Reporters United, feel free to add more and also reply to the second question about the tax uh, issue of Greek ship owners, please. Thank you. And, and thank you very much. And just quickly, please, just so that we can you know, try and honor the time. But yeah, please. Uh, to Doris, over to you. Yes, yes about the Greek. Yes, just 30 taxes. seconds. Yes, yes so uh, the Greek ship owners, they don't pay taxes in, in Greece, uh, despite the fact that we had the crisis that, you know, we lost the 25% of the Greek GDP during, uh, during that. They don't pay tax, and a, lo a lot of times they have their ships and their companies, you know, in uh, offshore, not in Greece, in, you know, in jurisdictions that are very friendly to for taxation. So this is not, this is the situation not only for the Greek ship owners, all the ship owners around the world, they usually do that. But of course, this is the trend in Greece. They only, they, they are more visible here, the ship owners are visible here with, you know, foundations and philanthropy in order to have a good image in the Greek society, despite the fact that they are not very good to pay taxes. It's legal. They're not obliged by the Greek, or forced by the Greek government. There's only one law that says they can pay taxes. No, they can, not they should, they must, but they don't pay. Uh, yeah, no, so, <laughs> as, as, as we know, sometimes uh, giving folks the option to pay taxes of whatever particular background, <laughs> that doesn't always happen. So no, th thank you, uh, Tadori. So, so no, thank you all. And again, this is the first of a two part session. So Sotiris, I have put Sotiris's email in the chat. Thank you. Uh, for the questions, and please know um, that uh, Sotiris is available in between if you want to extend in terms of the impact, that lovely question from Liza, um, around trying to do this in your, um, trying to do this in your country as well. So just uh, three quick remarks from me. Uh, please complete the brief survey that will pop up after you log off. Esther will send an email with a PDF of the slide deck. Liza made a suggestion about including uh, the impact. And then a recording of this session will be available on YouTube. Uh, the last thing I just want to share is we welcome people uh, becoming and joining part of our community. So um, please, I have put information about membership. We, we do have a, a membership fee, but we're very flexible with the sliding scale. We want to be sensitive. We don't want that to be a barrier. Mostly we want people to be part of our community. 
So please join me again in thanking our wonderful presenters. And before we sign off, so Tiris, can you just answer George's question and those who want to go, but George is asking, are we meant to investigate our own country's connections to Russian oil? So if people want to hear the answer to that question, please stay on. Otherwise, please feel free to head off. So, so Tiris, final word to you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. And thanks, George, for the question. Very nice point. I would say that if you want to do this, please get in touch with me and we can work together on that. Otherwise, I really want to be very flexible with the next session. And I want to welcome people and invite people who have worked on similar or not similar issues, but for people that have created data sets or want to create data sets to really share their experiences, to really share the reports and their projects with the rest of the group. And we can have, you know, a very warm and informal chat about these kind of projects. Uh, so many options. Feel free again to reach out to me and I can share the data and I can share instructions about the data and how we can do this together until this next session. Or feel free to organize a short presentation, five, ten minutes, even more. But please get in touch with us so that we'll organize in advance. I just want this to be very flexible and I want you to make use of the data as well. So everything is open to us.